Um, well, I, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I also had a wonderful time in the ladies' room where all the uh, women with marvelous hats from the 1920s were, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it was Continental Congress reenacted, but it was a, the south of a different time. <laughs> you didn't get to go, Jonathan. Um, and it's, and I, I always show up when Jonah calls, Jonah calls, because uh, he always has a good crowd. You never know quite who you're speaking to. Um, I teach at SICE now. I used to teach at Yale. Uh, before that, I had a sultry nightlife, and I have continued it ever since, of having come late to international law, unlike Jenny Wright's former boss, uh, Anne Marie Slaughter, who was reared from the, from the, from the uh, bassinet uh, as a European. I came to international <coughs> law after I had been a counterterrorism prosecutor in the Southern District of New York and had knocked about a bit. And I think it gives you a slightly more Unwanted, but un 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 ineluctably compelling Hobbesian view of life that uh, the world is a, as every Jewish boy and girl should know, even half Jewish girls, not a very friendly place, oftentimes. <laughs> and you can quote the Magna Carta, and you might get David Rubenstein to buy it from you, but uh, <laughs> other than that, they, it, it may not protect you. So I, I, I my, my, in, in my, just to explain my, my, uh, my vantage point. In the 90s, I, de I largely decamped in, in, the, in, in the evenings to go into New York and run the UN program at the Council on Foreign Relations and spent a great deal of time with, if, and if you have money to take people to lunch, you can find out everything about politics. And, uh, as Kofi Annan was coming up and Boutros was uh, serving out his tenure, it, it was the great moment of belief that the UN was being reborn, the Cold War was over, there would no longer be Security Council vetoes, collective security would work as Henry Wallace had madly thought it would. Uh, Harry Truman was, I think, tougher than that. Um, and when that came a cropper in Bosnia with the European ice cream men, when the US delayed intervening in Bosnia for three long years, which I think was a profound mistake, mostly because my Democratic president didn't want to start his term with a war, it very quickly took the bloom off the rose. And then with the attempt to um, disarm uh, Iraq, uh, having chosen not to bring the fight to Baghdad, but rather to leave the city intact and to, to, to depend upon the cooperation of Security Council members to disarm Saddam, uh, I was very friendly with Rolf Achaeus and followed his nip and tucks and feints and jabs trying to carry out the, the stripping of the WMD in uh, Iraq, and now you will put me in your loony cage. I still am not persuaded that they weren't there, and now in the Becca Valley, whatever. Uh, but I, I think that decade really showed that the dream of, uh, of, of convergence and uh, amity in the Security Council was going to be always uh, derailed by obviously differing national interests by corruption. Uh, the sanctions which had been counted upon as the main modality for coercion in the League of Nations and yay in the UN uh, were very hard on the civilian population, very hard to maintain. And the decade ended, I think, in a very desultory mood that um, the co collection, collective action in real life didn't work much better than it had worked in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. Uh, and I think that's still the case. Sanctions really uh, don't have any compelling uh, power except over a very long term, and the army always eats first. In the case of Iran, they may have some effect only because Iran has vir virtually no gasoline refining capability, and so any radical action that Ahmadinejad might be uh, impelled, in, in, tempted to take by putting sea mines in the Straits of Hormuz cut both ways. We just had a very interesting talk with the former chief of naval operations saying that uh, Though they'd be very pesky for us trying to ship oil out, it would be equally pesky for the Iranians trying to ship gasoline in. So unless he wants to have a walking only Iran, he has to think twice about uh, being quite so radical in his, in his, uh, in his uh, tactics. But I, I, I'm afraid I, 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 eat, I worry, I guess, in the, in, the, in the large sense, I'm not telling you how to vote, uh, that we are going to carve up our defense capability with the uh, sequestration of the budget, that things we will need to both counter out of area threats uh, as China becomes much more ambitious in its uh, uh, idea of a near abroad of Southeast Asia, 
will be less capable of countering that if we don't have a sufficient number of carrier battle groups to reduce the size of the Navy. Uh, I wish we had an F-22 that could do stealthy uh, attacks without being detected. Uh, the F-35 is very nice, but fighter pilots I know who have been shot down tell me that it ain't the same thing. Um, uh, I worry in Europe that we will again be mesmerized by what are wonderfully uh, uplifting talk shops, NATO, European Union, uh, OSCE, uh, but which have very limited capability for action. Like Libya just about exhausted what NATO can do. Uh, and there always is the blowback from the human rights community because, of course, you almost inevitably harm civilians when you carry out military actions. But in the case of Syria, which is our most immediate dilemma, um, there, there, is, there is a role here for the Jewish community to think through, uh, which I, I take it that, from many of my odd sources and methods, that, that Assad feels some security because the Alawites have been the compromise of choice among the Christian community and, yes, perhaps even Israel. Better the devil you know. And therefore, there might be a reluctance to dislodge him. I don't, I've not talked at intimate levels with the Israeli politicians, but I, some people have told me that they think that Assad, one of his aces in the hole, is a kind of Israeli reluctance to topple him for fear of what might come next. And I, I take that point. But at the same time, his brutality at this point is beyond measure. He's made a fool of a person who's not a fool, my friend Kofi Annan, who's been made to look idiotic coming in with a mission and being utterly ignored. Uh, he makes, again, NATO look impotent. Uh, any intervention would be very difficult because it's an urban terrain in which to fight. And really, air campaigns there don't work well. Uh, but, and we've seen that the Russians who I, I was at, I was at uh, this funny little Munich Security Council in the mid-aughts at the time when Putin, Putin, I like to call him Putin, he's prostitute in French. Uh, he comes here, takes off his jacket, and he says he's a tough guy. He's killed his tigers. And he was quite disrespectful to everybody at the meeting. And then Medvedev came in afterwards to make nice. Uh, but it was quite clear, you know, Russia feels its own a willful pride of place. <coughs> and Sergei Lavrov, who I used to know in New York, he even wanted to be an assistant secretary general at one point. He was running for some UN post so he could retire gracefully. To, to see him now talking like a thug is very distasteful and dismaying. But clearly Russia versus Turkey uh, versus Syria, and Russia has its own interests in the Black Sea, so that whatever the Turks are in inclined to do to try to help the Syrian rebels is going to have the danger of a reaction by Mother Russia. Um, and frankly, I don't think anybody, not the US, certainly not the Europeans, has the appetite to put troops on the ground. Monitors, yes. Ice cream men, as we used to say in Bos Bosnia, yes. But troops on the ground, no. So we have a very tragic circumstance where the Syrian le rebels are really allowed to fend for themselves. R2P, responsibility to protect, sounded great when it was enunciated as a doctrine by Kofi Annan's folks in the high-level panel in uh, 2004. <coughs> but even at the time, it came with the proviso that it was meant to be a doctrine of self-control by rulers rather than uh, any doctrine of humanitarian intervention with or without the Security Council. So I fear me that, and th this is the part that my mother, who was a little bullshy, <laughs> more than, certainly more than <coughs> me, uh, never quite took to heart. I know she would have if she had thought it through which is that if you are a human rights person and a pacifist, then you'd better believe in a very efficacious God because uh, you actually need military power to create the deterrence that makes other actors uh, who have local regional ambitions uh, dis disinclined to act upon them for fear of what will happen to them. And um, sanctions may deter uh, Mrs. Assad if she can't get her, this is not a sexist statement since I'm female, her, uh, her, her Gucci shoes, but uh, it's not going to happen anytime soon, and, and, and I, therefore I worry that they're really going to destroy a country which is already very delicately in balance, whose health and well-being is essential to stability in Lebanon. It's going to make Jordan very, very nervous about uh, minority issues. So I see it as a very, very dangerous time, and one in which it's the wrong moment for the U.S. to be under-investing in um, uh, capability, and one in which uh, 
we have to practice a very subtle Kissingerian game of trying to allow the Saudis to take part in the way that they feel is sufficiently gemütlich for them, We're trying to engage Jordan, trying to engage Turkey. Um, but I don't see any easy fix. I think Syria is going to be bloody for a very long time and make a fool of any idea of collective security. Uh, good things that are happening, I suppose, uh, small good things. We're more, much more engaged in Africa, and that's useful both to create the literal uh, uh, lily pads from which we could later, if we ever wanted to, do a bit more peacekeeping. Um, we, uh, I think, have awoken to the fact that well, there's a strategic game being played in South Asia, that as the Chinese make their string of pearls with terrific harbors in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, that we ought to worry about losing uh, <laughs> the road to India, so to say, that uh, the, the Chinese are very, very uh, interested in having friends to vote for them and places to recommission their, their uh, both their commercial and their military vessels, and that there is a great game, if you will, being played in maritime South Asia. Um, I do think we have come to realize the tug of war that is present in the Chinese mind, uh, that they very much want to be an economic partner. Hank Greenberg was, gave a talk recently in which he urged that we do much more in allowing the Chinese to invest in the continental US and that they could be good uh, colleagues, and that may well be true, but there are many sac sectors in, the, in, the, in, the, in Chinese politics just as there are in American politics. And the Chinese military uh, may have a slightly more primitivist view. My, my favorite anecdote, I was visiting our campus in Nanjing. Beautiful new building, looks like it was in, in uh, San Rafael, California. It's light, it's airy, it flows. We have a deal there with the Chinese to teach some kids. Uh, and I went to see the water purification plant in the basement for this seven million dollar building, which is making Hopkins go broke, uh, but which, which is educating American kids in to be truly fluent in Chinese. And the director showed off the water purification plant, but to get there, we had to go through this funny round door. And I said, what's this? And he said, oh, that's the blast proof bomb shelter. <laughs> and I said, how much did that cost? Well, in this building we finished 10 years ago. And he said, about a million, out of the seven million that the building cost. And then I saw the sign saying it was in the, Nan the Taiwanese Naval Defense Zone. <laughs> so the Chinese really do, it could just be sentimentality, but, it, and it may well be that Taiwan will be so integrated economically that the Chinese don't have to ever think about doing anything else other than buying up the corporations. But there still is, a, and I think a, you know, a slightly sentimental, call it archaic, call it, call it uh, pugnacious attitude that, uh, they have the coastline, it's far from our shores, and maybe a uh, pivot toward Asia will suffice, but not if you don't have a navy. So I worry that even knowing all this in a time of economic straight, straightened circumstances, that we will deeply underinvest in what we need to have to be the world's balancer. And not to sound like a Unitarian, but uh, it is a collective security investment. It's not narcissistic, it's not self-regarding. The UN has really always <coughs> depended upon American power, projection power, whether it was intervening in East Timor or elsewhere. Uh, no other country had the, the uh, necessity to be able to do transcontinental operations, which we needed for Mother Russia, but happened to have the great benefits that would equip us to allow the deployment of troops elsewhere around the globe. So I worry that um, even though, as we now all know from David Sanger and from Tom Donilon, uh, the president's become pretty tough on drone warfare, uh, although I have some scruples about that, actually. But uh, nonetheless, I, I do think that a certain geostrategic naivete can be a very dangerous thing if we're not very careful in persuading the Congress and the executive branch, whoever might win, that this is an investment that one needs for, for the long term. Um, and finally, on uh, uh, terrorism, I used to do, I used to enforce uh, economic sanctions cases when I was a prosecutor. I um, uh, have written about bin Laden from before 9-11, worrying about his nature. Um, and I was pretty raunchy during the days immediately after 9-11, albeit very much against torture gate. Um, but I, I, I do think that uh, uh, our ability to really persuade Arab youth that this is not or Muslim youth, this is not the way, is something that's crucially important. We did a panel at SAIS yesterday in which we, the general opinion from a Freedom House 
Egypt director who has battle scars to prove the point uh, that she cares, she just came out of a cage on trial in Cairo, was that the new uh, Muslim Brotherhood president actually may represent a much more diverse constituency of people who are simply anti-military, who feel that they have to uh, make their way as they can through him in, as opposed to, and, and that the uh, rather plain Jane nature of his wife's couturier uh, is not how you should judge his intentions. Uh, and that f the first thing one had to do was try to dislarge the army's hegemony in Egypt. And that, that may well be true. There's been no sign of Egypt disowning the Camp David Accords. Um, I wonder if <coughs> really whether disorder in Gaza is going to be very much to their taste in a time when they themselves are having issues of transition. Um, but, uh, and finally, just on, on, a, on a purely local note, uh, to note we, we just finished, brief, all, we, many of us submitted briefs in the Kiobel case, which is not quite as famous as the, uh, the, uh, the, the Medicare, the, uh, the Obamacare case. Uh, but this has to do with a funny little uh, uh, a 1789 statute, which allows suits to be brought in American courts for torts, meaning bad acts, crimes, committed abroad. And a bunch of us who had been doing uh, terrorist financing cases did a, did a kind of a switcheroo. We were on the cons liberal side, but yet from a slightly conservative point of view, arguing that you want to be able to sue entities abroad that do terrorist financing as a way of, of, of uh, suppressing the ability to finance operatives uh, abroad. And that requires that one be willing to, in fact, extend American judicial jurisdiction uh, overseas, even if it might be seen as inconvenient by BP, Chevron, and other oil companies. So I, I, I think in, 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 in many, many circumstances, the, the, uh, the kind of radical divisions between liberal and conservative are not so self-evident as what one how one should operate. It's very important, I think, that the U.S. be seen as a country that does care about international law, that does not think that the private economy can be operate in an utterly heedless way, and that therefore, uh, uh, in this particular case, if you happen to see the outcome in uh, next January, February, it's going to be re-argued in October, uh, is one that's very important for the America's reputation as, uh, as supporting rule of law around the globe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.